All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for our Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. Thanks for joining us today. As you get here, say hi, let us know that you're here, and let us know where here is for you. Where are you joining this conversation from? If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis, and I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason. And that's to find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. Doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar. You said, hey, 2023 is my year and I'm on the runway to starting my own thing. Or maybe you started your own thing a year ago or 10 years ago or 27 years ago, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of entrepreneur architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. I have a special guest co-host today. You're used to coming here and seeing me, usually without the glasses, but seeing me, and uh, joined by Catherine McPhail, but Catherine is... uh, it was on the edge whether or not she was going to be able to make it back from a site visit today. So Chris Novelli, who is another Massachusetts architect, is my guest co-host today. Chris, thank you, first of all, and welcome. Oh, no problem, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, everyone. And yeah, I am not Catherine, so hopefully <laughs> I can... Uh... You know, hopefully I can fill in and do just as good of a job as she does. <laughs> well, it's it, you You now have the pressure of uh, carrying the mantle for uh, yeah. Massachusetts architects. So just, it, no pressure there. The bar is set really high. So <laughs> I, hope to, I hope to live up to it. Uh, I, I, I have faith. You're going to be just fine. <laughs> um, but it's great, great to have you here hosting with me today. Uh, looking over in the room, so to speak, I see Leslie Dival. I think she's the first on the screen today, uh, joining us from YouTube today. So, Leslie, welcome yeah. from uh, South Florida. Glad you're here. You're the first in the room, which means that you are the winner of the John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award today. Congrats, Leslie. She says she's super excited about today's guest. We are, too. Scott, welcome back from San Francisco. He's joining us via Facebook. He says, howdy, from no rain today, San Francisco. That's a welcome relief out there, I know. Uh, Mark Arla Page, cloudy and rain in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Hey, it's baseball weather sort of here <laughs> in Indianapolis <laughs> today. Uh, Daryl, welcome. Uh, let's see. He's joining us from Rochester. And uh, Christian's joining us from Ithaca, New York. And that Coffee Sketch podcast guy over on Twitch says good afternoon from Flint, mm-hmm. Michigan. I wonder who Glad that could that, be. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. I wonder if that could be Kurt. And uh, Michael Dern. <laughs> Hi, Michael from California. He's joining us from LinkedIn. Wow, we're covering covering all of the uh, the platforms here. So Yoko, good morning or good afternoon, whatever this is from uh, Alexandria and uh, Ryan Shoup from New Jersey. Barry, welcome from Scotland. And yes, Catherine uh, has taken on a different look today. So uh, welcome back from Scotland, Barry. Cheers to you this evening. And Jessica, hello. Welcome back from Los Angeles. All right. So if you are right now in a Facebook group and you're commenting away and you're saying, hey, why did my comment not show up like Jessica's or like Ryan's or like Yoko's? Well, it's because you are in a private Facebook group. And there are rules, <laughs> there are privacy policies, your name, your likeness, your comments can't leave that group unless you give Facebook permission to communicate with Restream, which is this platform that we use for our simulcasts here. So down in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, there is a URL, open up a separate browser window, type chat.restream.io slash FB. So FB like Facebook, chat.restream. Dot io slash fb into your browser window and a couple of clicks later you'll solve that problem you'll give facebook permission to talk and um and your your comments will show up just like chad's have here and uh if you say hey i've done that before why is it working well those permissions expire at some point i don't know the timing of it and um so you just you just need to uh, try it again it should it just solve it should solve all the problems that you have honestly yeah i heard I mean, that that link solves all the problems it does. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. It's like the easy button or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So chat.restream.io slash FB is the problem solver here today. So check that out if you are, uh, if you're having trouble with that today. 
Um, okay, let's see. Who else has popped in? Arturo has joined us from San Diego. Chad's in the ATL. And uh, Yoko says she's going to try to listen while reviewing door frames and hardware submittals. Well, mm. uh, good luck with that, Yoko. Honestly, we're going to do our best to keep you from, <laughs> from getting anything done. Um, but <laughs> it's a good reminder. Even if you've joined us and you're just planning to listen in, or if you're planning on multitasking, we're glad you're here. At least just take a minute to say hi. Just drop it in the comments from whatever platform you're watching from and uh, let us know that you're along for the ride today and if you are brave like yoko and you think you can multitask during this go right ahead we completely understand but with that i you know i don't know i think we stocked the green room okay it's a different hopefully. request hopefully. yeah <laughs> yeah i'm a little bit jealous honestly because i'd like to be in the green room eating sweet pastries but we may have run out by now We've kept our guests back there for quite a while, um, but we had a variety of sweet pastries back there. So we'll see how uh, we'll we'll see how those go. Mark says, "Brave like Yoko is a is a great band name. It really is, Yoko. You should uh, you should uh, grab that while you can, Yoko." So our guest today is an architect, a teacher, a speaker, an author, and. I think he's an artist as well. We'll we'll see if he agrees, but I think he's an artist as well. He's the creator of Sketch Like an Architect, the video series, the workshops, the courses, and the author of the book by the same name. David Drazzle, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Hello. Hello, Jeff and Chris and everyone else. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, be here and honored. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. And I hope I hope the sweet pastries were, oh, were yeah. you know, met your expectations. <laughs> They're fantastic, especially the Danish pastry type of thing, you know, with the, a lot of sugary <laughs> frosting on top. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, well, you know, hopefully that'll keep you going because we're, we're keeping David up late. He's in Prague. Uh, he's based in Prague. He's in Prague right now. And uh, so, first of all, we really appreciate you staying up late. And uh, hopefully the sugary treats can keep you going through this conversation here. Absolutely. Absolutely. No worries. Yeah. Um, so I, I, what I want to ask is because I, I have been talking about this all week, as you know, we frame our entire week of conversations around the theme that we're going to talk about on, on, um, Thursday. And so we've talked about simple tools and we've talked about organizing ideas and developing ideas and things like that. But, um, I have been saying all week that I love going over to your Instagram, uh, channel and, it's just sort of therapeutic in a way to watch you sketch and, and teach how to sketch. I mean, there's, there's something, something very visceral, something very tactile about that. So the question I have is, have you always been a great sketcher? Oh yeah. I was born with it. And <laughs> if you haven't been born with it, you are doomed completely. That's the, that's the reality. Or that's uh, that's an opinion that I very often kind of am. Um, yeah, I, I I meet with it. I get in touch with it. Uh, of course, no. Um, I I have been a terrible drawer and sketcher with huge like confidence problems mm -hmm. when I was especially a teenager. I used to I, I used to love to draw when I was a kid, and I was drawing superheroes, Batman's and Superman's. Spider-Man was one of my favorite as well. Yeah. And Pokemons, of course, because that was the time. Now it's kind of coming back, but that was the, the first time, I think. So I was drawing like a, as a kid. And then I stopped when I was um, in teenage yeah, years. And I stopped because I was afraid it's not going to look that good. Yeah. And you know what? I was right. It didn't. It really didn't. And because of that, I was kind of discouraged. And I stopped practicing and I stopped drawing. And it, it's this wishes cycle. And then I started again just before I I wanted to start at the university to study architecture. So we had to, there was some kind of entrance exams. Um, and you had to bring your portfolio of drawings or you had to draw something on spot. You had like two, oh, wow. three hours and they give you two, three assignments, and you have to do something for them on, on the spot. So I think the one year before that, I've been a little bit training, 
I've been enjoying some still life and I've been getting a little bit back, not to shame, that there was no, that there was never any shame that I was in, but just um, getting more acquainted. But basically I entered the architecture school. I studied here in Prague, at least my bachelor uh, at the Czech Technical University here in Prague. And basically I entered it as a tabula rasa. So I was mm -hmm. a blank sheet of paper and I was like, okay, you know, put, put it in. And I, I was very open to learn kind of their way, how they taught it and their techniques. And that's where it started to click off, to click for me. So yeah, that's kind of a long winded answer to your <laughs> short question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's great, but I, I think it's a great illustration because as you said, um, I think that's something that many of us, whether we're talking about sketching or or some other topic, there's there's that imposter syndrome or there's that, you know, I'm just not that good at it. This morning we talked about uh, trying new things, which I heard you mention in a podcast interview. And, I, and, and it just struck me, you know, at what point did we stop just being really enthusiastic about trying new things? Because that trying new things opens up so much freedom and so much, or it can, I guess, open up so much freedom and so much joy. And, um, so, I, you know, I love the fact that you, 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 you liked it, you dropped it, you came back to it. And if you, if anybody that's in the audience, just go over to it's your, uh, Instagram is David underscore Drazzle, isn't it? Correct. So, so go over to Instagram and, uh, and find David's, uh, account there and look at his sketches, right? These are, these are not the sketches of, of somebody that, um, you know, that, that stopped sketching because the Spider-Mans weren't so good anymore. This, these are sketches of a person that stopped and then restarted and developed a practice, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, so with that, <clears throat> with that comment there though, David, um, I'm sure there's a lot of us in the community, um, maybe maybe not in this group, because I think uh, there's a lot of people who love uh, sketching uh, in, in this community. But um, I think that there's a lot of people in architecture that, that you know, might have done a lot of sketching in school, but then have stopped, right? So yeah. do you have any good tips for someone who hasn't sketched for a while and is sort of starting to get back into it? Oh yeah, I think uh, both you you and Jeff mentioned it, the, the word practice or, or habit, building the habit. Um, I think that's what worked for me. And the really important part, I think, habit building is, is a whole another chapter, right? Uh, by the way, I love Atomic Habits, uh, the book, which is yeah. uh, amazing. But um, I would recommend uh, if I'm in, in any position to give any advice, uh, I usually don't like to put myself there, but um, what I think works both for me and for people who I recommended it to was start with like five minutes, five minutes and draw what you like, what you love, what you're excited about. And it can go back to the super, superheroes again. It can, go, it can go back to, I don't know, if you like floral elements, it doesn't have to be really architecture related. Just uh, grab the pencil or pen or whatever. And yes, yeah, start doodling, start drawing, whatever you see you're inspired by, or just to get in that habit. And that should just build over time. If you have fun, just stick to it. Don't overdo it. Five minutes is enough. If you, if you do more than five minutes, fantastic. But if you don't feel like it, hey, drop it after five minutes. It's okay. Yeah. And it's like a low barrier entry to the habit and practice of sketching. And I think actually that's um, what worked for me. It felt, you mentioned it already, like they're therapeutic. That does the word like more like mindfulness practice. Now mm -hmm. it's a, kind of a buzzword to be mindful yeah. all the time. But um, I, I always like to, when I'm brainstorming, when I'm trying to solve something, I always like to doodle or, or draw and trying to use that as a tool to help me visualize and understand my own thoughts. It's not yeah. about doing fancy drawings or anything polished or presentational. It's about, okay, how can this help me visualize what I'm trying to do here? That's kind of the first 
step. And from my experience, I would love to hear from the audience today, but I think like most of the sketching when it happens in architectural practice, it's this kind of rough and dirty sketches, yeah. which are not meant to be always presented to someone, but it's mm -hmm. more for us, for internal process, for really understanding the process, solving some, some problems and just getting it out on paper. And I think it, it's a very similar practice as with journaling or, you know, bullet journaling or something like that. It just is how we're wired that it really relieves a lot of information and stress. And it feels good to put it somewhere physically on a small piece of paper. Yeah. So yeah. A, a number of us, uh, we, we have this uh, clubhouse uh, a group that we've been talking every morning uh, for you know probably about a year and a half now. And maybe like six months ago, I think the conversation was around sketching and thinking, uh, you know, in the connection with your with your mind and your hand and and getting the ideas out quick. And um, a couple of the members of our community, Christian being one of them, um, started a, a, a Facebook uh, group, 864 seconds sketches. Uh, and so, you know, I think that represents 1% of, of a day. Uh, or, or Christian can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure he will. Um, uh, so I, I, and the, and the thought was that you can, you can all sort of just, uh, you know, take 1% of your day and do some sketches and, and post them to the group. So I think Christian's asking you, uh, right here, if you'll, if you'll join the group. Uh, so just go to Facebook, 864 seconds sketches. But but he only gets four hundred seconds. I don't understand what I I've not done the math, so I don't know the significance of the four hundred seconds. What is that? Well, five yeah, minutes? Yeah, but I think probably because Dave is better than us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, so so this this must, sounds like the uh, competitive sketching league is what's competitive sketching <laughs> league. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding about that. Yeah. But, but I, I think that's a great idea. And, and, you know, David, you can commit to that if you are on the air if you want. But I'll check that out. I'll check that okay. out. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, but I, I think the point that you just made about a lot of the sketches in the office or in the practice are rough sketches. They're not presentation okay. sketches. And that's one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to ask you about is – and I know there's different levels and spectrums of this, but what is in your mind, what is the importance of sketching, you know, as a, as a technique, as a practice? Right. Right. Uh, I think we, we mentioned it already, the um, really connection between our, our minds and our hands that, that's, that's there. And uh, I like to compare it to, our normal kind of status quo way of work when we are in front of our computers and we have a mouse and keyboard. I, I have it in here as well. And I have some screen and user interface and I'm focused on where to click and what buttons to push and what does that do. And sometimes I forget what I'm trying to achieve because I'm so focused on what I'm trying to tell the software to do. So it's what I'm trying to say, it's a completely different mindset compared yeah. to when I use super simple tools like pen and paper, when it's just me and it's very, really natural human and it just flows so much better. It's also connected to the state of flow, mm. right? Where our um, problem solving skills and our creativity is at its peak. That's where we are in the flow. We kind of forget about everyone else. We are in the zone. We we don't kind of perceive time anymore. That's the, the state that we are very often as kids. And sketching, hand sketching can be one of the triggers to get there uh, sooner or more effectively as well. So um, I think the importance is, is back to the creativity, which is kind of sometimes hard to get with softwares if you are not a super user of a software yeah meaning that you would be super comfortable in that environment already. Right. Um, it might be hard to, to get into that creativity when using softwares, especially the complex one, BIM, Archicad, Revit, and similar. Um, and we, we had an interesting conversation in my summits and, and, and in my live stream videos a few years back with other architects. And I love the approach 
that there was an internal and external way of communication for or as a use case for sketching. So the, the rough and dirty sketches that we talked about, that's an example of internal communication. So I'm, that's basically for myself. I'm trying to understand my thoughts, trying to solve a problem, I'm trying to brainstorm. So that's an in, internal way of communication. And then there's external, and that goes more to effective visual communication, meaning that by that image, I make a sketch, no matter how rough or how polished, I make a sketch, I make an image. And my goal is for the viewer of the image to immediately understand what I mean. That's mm -hmm. effective communication, visual communication for me. And that's the external way. And that's where all the kind of traditional rules of image making and drawing apply, like composition, like storytelling, focal points perspective, scale, proportion, all these design principles and all that stuff. And that's where we have an idea that's already formed because we, we've done the internal communication and of course some, some design process around it. And now we are ready to communicate an idea to someone else in a way that they understand. And in a way that it's easy, that it's fast, that it's natural, I can do it on spot, I can do it on a meeting, I can do it on a construction site visit. I can do it anywhere without really needing to open up a 3D mobile software and starting doing my thing. You know, that's that's not really um, as time effective. Yeah. So I, I would see I would see for us architects and designers these two primary roles: internal, external communication, and now it reminds me uh, a favorite. It's not a quote, it's more of a definition of a designer. And I use it all the time. So you you might have heard me <laughs> say that before, but I really like that. And it completely relates to sketching and the role and the importance. I like the definition of a designer that says that a designer is someone who solves problems and communicates the solutions. So this is exactly those internal and external ways of communicating where sketching is just fantastic. It's not the only tool, and I'm not very dogmatic about it, like, hey, everybody should go back to pen and paper and drafting tables. No, I love the technology. I just still believe there is a lot of value and benefits in sketching by hand as, as a practice for creativity and uh, architectural practice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a great way to explain it. And as you were talking about it, it struck me, I, I know this is not completely accurate, but it struck me that, you know, you're talking about the internal and the external and the simple tools. And then as, as I was thinking about BIM and the AI software, the uh, different AI softwares that are available in generative design and things like that, it seems like those are mainly focused on the external communication side, which then leaves a gap on the backside. How do you, how do you fill the gap and how do you get to the point where you're able to go from the the things you need to figure out, the things, the the in, internal communication piece of it, and then, I guess, feed that into a machine. Um, it, so, yeah. go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great point. I actually tested it uh, just recently with one of the AI tools, Midjourney, and uh, I've tested it not for the external, but as a way to speed up the iterative iterative process and brainstorming. So it's a lot about kind of going back to the prompts and even you can feed it your own image to start with or to blend with to give you new ideas, fresh kind of looks on the thing that you're solving or you're dealing with. So I see it, I don't see it as a threat uh, I, I see it more as, it, I don't know, I know it's not even a tool, it's, it's so much more, but um, I see it more as an opportunity for us to speed up some things, especially because architecture, architectural design is very iterative, right? You go back and forth and every time you learn something new, you make informed decisions that go back and it, it grows like this. So uh, the process gets more and more complex as our buildings get more and more complex. And I think 
this using AI tools to generate a multitude of ideas or points of view on a specific problem can just speed things up in, let's say, some of the initial phases and, and show us uh, opportunities or directions that we may not see without it. So I, I've used it in, in, in this way briefly. I, I spent it's it's kind of a rabbit hole when you get into it. I don't know if you if you've tested it yourself, but it, it kind of gets addi uh, addictive a bit uh, because yeah, you can just feed it different prompts and experiment and test with how it reacts to it. And when you feel like, oh, this is interesting, but I would like it more, I don't know, abstract or modern, or I, I like to exaggerate the perspective or whatever. Um, it's um, it's kind of a never-ending <laughs> story of uh, yeah how you can get stuck with mid journey for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. So of course, as with any other new technologies, it's still very very newborn, but uh, and we we will have to learn to work with it effectively. But uh, I think for like dumping ideas and, and getting some quick feedback, like a sounding board. It might work. It might work interestingly well. Yeah, yeah. That's we we talk about that. We we try to cover some of these tech topics, tech um, tools as much as we can. And and I know there's a lot of fear around them, but but at the end of the day, they're tools. Maybe not simple tools. You know, not simple tools like pencils, pens, and and paper. But um, that that blending or or the using the things together, I think, is really interesting. Um, when, when you decided to, or, or after, I guess, after you've, you've been through your bachelor's, you had, I think you said four semesters of, of sketching classes there and you, you started to get back into sketching. Why did, why did you decide to start? Well, let's just start at uh, the Instagram account. Why did you decide to jump onto Instagram and start sketching? Uh, <laughs> the real reason, the honest reason, um, like not the fancy story, brand story behind it, but the real reason, starting an Instagram back then, it was 2016, and I was a fresh graduate. It was just easier than to start my website. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. I was like, hey, mm, I, I should get a job. I was looking for a job. Uh, I was just a fresh graduate. We were in Denmark. We uh, we did our bachelor here in Prague. It's a, Bachelor is like an undergrad for you, right, in the US. So it's a four year program for us. This is a little bit longer. And then a master's program, uh, extra two years, which is a grad program for you, right? Uh, and we did that, the master's in, in Denmark. When I say we, I mean me and my wife. Uh, and that's that's what we did. So we we went abroad and study architecture there, and then we wanted to look for jobs there to stay there for a few years. And actually, it started during the studies in Denmark that I was really exposed to many different new people and internationalities from all Europe. Yeah, it was mostly Europe, both Danish people as well as the rest of Europe in in one environment. And it showed so many differences in the backgrounds and how few of the people were actually, let's say, in a good relationship with sketching as a tool. And from there, I could see like people were amazing, especially from Poland, great people, great sketching skills, which translated into great presentation skills, great photography, great visualizations great you know, graphic sense of the layouts and the drawings and it was just it was just beautiful to look at their work and when you compare it to someone who really you know repelled drawing or and didn't really build a relationship and i think usually it's not the student's fault but it's how the school is set up uh, it really translated into their communication skills, visual communications, how they could put together drawings or any kind of visual. And because we are architects and we present ourselves and our work with mostly visuals, it just showed. 
So it was like a little little bulb moment when I say, oh, it would be really helpful and beneficial for most people to get at least the basics mm -hmm. so they can use it as a, as a quick tool. And it will eventually improve all their other areas of visual presentation, whether it's digital or analog or mixed media. So it was actually during these studies that I found out that, okay, not everybody is kind of drilled in, in sketching and not everybody went through uh, four semesters and not everybody loved it. Mm -hmm. And, but I think, I believe everybody would benefit from it. So there was like this, okay, there was a problem and maybe I have uh, a little bit of an idea of a solution to it. So that's how it started. And after the school, we were looking for jobs. I, I thought I should put together some online portfolio that I could be proud of. And I, I started developing this sketch like an architect project and started, started basically documenting the work as I was sharing more things about how to sketch like an architect. So that's honestly how it started. And really, generally, it, it was more, it was easier way uh, how to get it started than setting up my website, which I eventually did in 2019. And I still found it super complex and overwhelming. <laughs> so I'm glad I did start with easy thing. Instagram, everybody was talking about it. And I think those years, 2016 through 18, 19, maybe 20 was really good years. Now mm -hmm. it's a different story, but um, yeah, that's, that's how it started. It was just one of the, one of the channels that I could, I could, yeah, document this, this work on or through. In your architecture projects, do you follow sort of like a, a framework of, of how you develop your designs? I know we talked a lot about a different um, softwares and, and I think that there's a, a, a number of people in this community, myself included, who like to take clients more from a, a rough sketch to a more refined computer model, whether it's, you know, Revit with Enscape or, or, or what other various softwares out there and sort of as you meet, you kind of like bring them along on, on, on the refinement. Do you, do you have a, a process that you follow? That's an interesting question. Um, I think my, my whole bachelor studies were about finding out a process that would feel true to me. And I was like, yeah, it's, you're very new. You're very fresh. You don't know much. Um, but it was like finding myself and funny enough, in, in Denmark, uh, we studied at Aalborg University and they have very kind of strict methodology that they teach you how to design. Uh, it's called integrated design process in problem-based learning. It's a kind of long <laughs> thing, but basically it's an iterative process with six phases. And funny enough, it's, I think sketching is like a stage number two. And what, what's funny is that they don't teach sketching at that university very much. I think there's like one program, one semester of like observation, how to observe and that's it. So even though it's a big portion of their iterative process, they don't really give you much of the tools or skills, mm -hmm. but there is this process. I think it starts with analysis and research and there is sketching and there are a few more, but basically you go, you go in loops, iterative design, and with, with each stage, uh, as you progress, you kind of go back and um, make informed decisions about things you didn't know enough before. And it's, 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 this, it's a lot about creating many variations and alternatives. Uh, I, and I mean like 20 concepts, 30 concepts to start with, evaluating them so it's very much a volume type of approach to work. And then you kind of make assessments on different stages and then you just push through maybe one, two uh, options that you're happy with, that you that you see like viable for the design brief or, or problem that you're solving. So it definitely influenced the way of, of work um, but I don't, I, I didn't feel like it was absolutely ideal way of, 
approaching. What I did like is very much uh, kind of research-based or data-driven uh, design process, which is really informed. We've done a lot of uh, computer uh, simulations. It's funny that in, in the Czech Republic in Prague, we were used to do everything by hand, even static calculations, all of that uh, crazy stuff. But in Denmark, they used different types of softwares for everything. A lot of it was in Grasshopper, uh, in, in Rhino, where you could create parametric models for static evaluations, for acoustic evaluations. And you created these models to really get the numbers out of it. Uh, that also apply for environmental design, indoor environment, as well as sustainability and energy consumption. So we've done all of these simulations, computer simulations. And what I think is nice about it is that, as, as people like to say, um, I, I, I first I heard it from Tim Ferriss, but it's the things you measure, what, what, what gets measured gets managed. Right. Yeah. So you have some hard data that you can compare and then you can make informed uh, decisions based on. And I think that's uh, really useful. So it's not that artistic approach anymore to I have this vision and I make a rough sketch and I let the team do the hard work and actually create the building out of it. How I think it was, you know, in mid 20th century, but it's a lot more about okay, we have this set of information, this set of data, what do we learn from them and how we can optimize to the next iteration to improve the design. So with this, I think it just gets so much more complex. And it reminds me of one specific uh, architectural company, studio, Henning Clarsen Architects. They're Danish, uh, I think they're world known uh, and I think they do a beautiful job. They have a special sustainability department and they, they are very much science-based and, and data-driven company. And I think it, it shows, it makes a lot of sense. It's there, there's still the kind of common sense approach, but it's backed up by numbers as well. So yeah, again, long-winded answer. <laughs> well I, th you know, my, well, my first reaction to that is I wonder how many people that are either watching this live now or will watch a recorded version of it. How many of you thought that when you heard that, that David was going to be on talking about sketch, like an architect, talk about sketching and, you know, all this, and, and now we're talking about data driven approaches, right. And, and, um, combining combining these two worlds if i don't know if that's a, a good way to say it but but i find that fascinating you know you're you're talking about sketching in a very different way i think than most people um are thinking about it i guess yeah yeah um i mean i don't, I don't see it as like two opposites or two things that are exclusive uh you know mutually exclusive it's it's just different tools that I think fit in different stages of the design process. So I'm a big, huge fan of BIM. Um, I'm a big Archicad fan. Uh, I know that's not you know what most of the world is using, but I'm a big Archicad fan. And I've been working, I used to work for uh, Danielson Architecture in Copenhagen, and they used Archicad. So um, it was beautiful experience. And I'm generally a big fan of this new technology, AR, VR, even AI. And actually I was on the path to become or, or just to follow a path of architectural visualizer doing, doing visualizations, doing 3D rendered CGI images. Uh, so I'm a big fan of that, but I think that there's something romantic as well as like creative and let's, as well as human that still kind of dragged me back to illustration type of thing and sketching and putting ideas on paper. And what I found out, it, it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if there was not enough demand for it already back then. Right. And I think the technology is a beautiful thing, 
but over the last few, maybe two, three decades, the technology and the new software has really overshadowed these, these kind of crafts that we use to cherish in architecture. I think physical scale model building is one of them. Sketching is another. None of these are used as much anymore because we use software. And um, it's uh, evolution. We can't stop that. Um, I'm just here to kind of remind few people that are willing to listen that, hey, there's still a great use uh, for for sketching that might be even more time effective and actually get you quicker feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work actually with uh, a few people. There are architects, interior designers, landscape designers, and one of the things that we work on together is implementing digital sketching as a way of their workflow for them to get quicker feedback from their clients. Let's say an example, you are an interior designer and you're renovating an apartment. What you can do is take your iPad, take a photo of something old, sketch on top of it in perspective. Now the apps can track the space for you to set up a perspective grid so you don't really have to figure it out yourself. And you can quickly sketch new layout, new furniture, new composition of whatever and get immediate feedback from the client. And not only that the client will see that you're quick on your feet and you can actually get something done, but they might be really impressed by your sketching abilities and they will see it right away. Hey, this is your, I don't know, TV wall right now. Here's what it can be. Uh, here's one of the suggestions. And you get the feedback, you get the loop. It's one more iteration that you can save time on and actually get things moving and get them approved or you know, it, it just starts what I really love. Sketching often starts conversation or dialogue because it's imperfect. And mm. I love that it can be imperfect. And I love that it can be human. And other people, surprisingly, not surprisingly, they resonate with it. And because they see it's imperfect, they are more invited and more welcome to join and take part in the process compared to when I present them with, you know, printed out laser straight uh, lines from AutoCAD drawing, which looks like everything is set in stone. So th there's a lot of kind of emotional things that are going on when we sketch and when other people see us sketch and kind of be creative or, or whatever, right? So I think um, this, fact that it can spark conversations and it can start dialogues instead of one-way communication, I think it's really powerful even today. And it probably won't stop being powerful because we still are human. Yeah. Yeah. A minute ago, you said, uh, you mentioned emotional and that, that was one of the things that I was wondering, right? When we're like you said, the internal and the external communication. So I'm figuring things out on the internal side. Now I'm presenting things essentially for someone else to see. But I wondered, as you were describing, even that is um, when when you're doing these sketches that are imperfect, I think that's a great way to say it. And they, they uh, um, uh, start or open up conversations. Is that also allowing clients or whoever the people that were the externals that we're communicating with, is it also allowing them to, to make their own uh, emotional connection with this idea that you're presenting, uh, because that that's very powerful and it's very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. It's like inviting them to be part of the process. Of course they are already part of the process, but they don't need to be just the receiver. They can be a really active part. And when they see they are part of the creative process, when ideas start to come, uh, I think it, it, it really, you know, grabs them more and attach them to that idea, to the process, and they want to see it through to, to get the result. So um, I believe, you know, maybe over time, I've learned that this might be also some, you know, human psychology and marketing technique, but that's what you learn kind of after that, yeah, inviting 
your audience or your viewer or your collaborator, client, contractor, boss mm -hmm. to be part of that really kind of makes them more attached, as simple as, as that. So um, I think this, this, really, this really works and gets us also closer on a human level. We earn more trust with whoever it is. And we are suddenly on the same boat. We are not on the opposite sides of the table. Like, hey, here's the budget. I can't make it this cheap. You know, let, let's let's figure it out. No, it's hey, we have a common goal. We have a common project that we are both partaking, just different roles. So uh, let's make it the best it can be. So I know th this sounds all romantic and and, and stuff, but uh, it actually works like that with these examples that I mentioned, because I hear that from these people, whether they are practicing architects or interior designers, I hear it quite often. And uh, it gives them better, better results. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my experience. I would love to hear from people in the, in the audience if this resonates or, or if they haven't really experienced something like that. Yeah. I yeah, think that's all the uh, that's all the reason more to to practice your sketching because that example that you gave of of working with a client and having them become involved in the process if if you're too reliant on technology as a crutch well then you're gonna say what are you gonna do oh sorry um you know I like those ideas I'm gonna go I'm gonna go and 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 model them up and I'll come back in two weeks with with something exactly. and then yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and th and that's a good or those are good questions as well. So uh, if you're out there in the audience, tell us about your experience with sketching. Tell us what you do with sketching, and also tell us your experience in sharing your sketches with your clients or whoever those you know the people that you're presenting uh, the ideas to. Just type that into the uh, comments wherever you are, Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube, and and let us know what you think about what David has been saying. Um, now you started teaching, I guess it, it, it starts with the Instagram story, right? But you started teaching people how to sketch. Who are you teaching how to sketch? Right. Um, I would say it's, um, generally it's two buckets of, of people, two types of people, um, that I think it's easy to describe it on. One bucket is, is professionals and whether they are students or already practicing professionals, they are yes architects. They are interior designers. Uh, I'm working now also with a landscape designer or architect. Uh, I've had people in my course who are civil engineers or even um, how is how is it called like IT architect? People who oh. don't really design architecture, but they need kind of visual sketching and sketch note taking and, and kind of putting their ideas on, on paper in a structured way. Uh, they, they were there as well. It's a minority, but, but, but still, but mostly it's people who would benefit professionally from being able to sketch and draw and put their ideas on paper, whether for themselves or for someone else. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one bucket. And the other bucket is non-professionals. Uh, there was a big movement of urban sketching. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but it, it's, it's those people who not necessarily are architects or in, in any way related to the AEC industry, but they just love to sketch architecture. They love to sketch in plein air um, outside. Uh, they love to take a coffee on Italian plaza and, and sketch the local That's church, or this, this kind of thing. And, they use pencil and ink, watercolor very often, and they as well need to understand the principles and, and basics of perspective and human scale and how to sketch human figures and kind of how to put it all together in a nice composition. So these are very often people as well who um, get my book or, or join my courses. So yeah, two, two groups of people and they are actually quite equal i think it's not like 80 20 it's pretty much more like 50 50 of people who are non-professionals as well as professionals yeah 
Yeah. And then also along the lines of teaching, you you ran it was the, called the sketch retreat. Was that did I get that right last year? Um, that was fantastic. And I I want to know personally, are you going to be doing that again this year? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for saying that. I I've had uh, actually a number of people uh, reach out to me about it, and yes, uh, there will be another sketching retreat uh, later this year in autumn. And it was actually the third year of an online summit, online conference that I've been I've been hosting over the last three years. And it started originally as the Archi Mentors Summit. Mm -hmm. And over the years, uh, you probably know people like Eric Reinhold or Bob Borson. Um, uh, and, and other amazing also US based uh architects who were part of them and it was more about architecture in general and different topics some of it was about small business and how to run your own practice some of it was about mental health the other was about sustainability parts of it were also on sketching but it was kind of scattered in the topics um and even though it was fantastic i i felt like it was a good decision to niche down just on sketching both analog and digital and that's what this sketching retreat was about. And uh, it was the third year. It was a lot more focused, but it was by far the most successful one in terms of the engagement and excitement and number of people. We had almost 15,000 people join us. We had over 30 great instructors who were contributing with their expertise in their workshops, teaching different techniques that are uh, very much Kind of their own how they develop their style and what they do so it was a nice mix of both analog and digital drawing techniques and uh it, it was it was fantastic experience so it's really a lot of work uh to pull it off uh but it's so much worth it and we've got so so great feedback and for sure we are doing it again this autumn uh, fantastic yeah yeah <laughs> I love that 15,000 people yeah. sketching. That's really amazing. And if I remember correctly too, it was free too, right? It was, yeah. Yeah. It was so yeah, so everyone out there, I mean, next wow. fall, I mean, keep your eyes out. Uh, and I think they, there was a paid side where you get like sort of like lifetime access to the videos, but if you wanted to go and and I think you had a week or so to to watch exactly. all the videos. Exactly. It's a kind of a hybrid model. Fantastic. Where, where it's free for everyone, it really is. And as normal conferences, it just takes certain, you know, period of time, usually three, five, seven days. I think we, we kept it open for six or seven days, absolutely for free and no restrictions. And if you like to get, we call it VIP ticket, of course, if you'd like to get just lifetime access to all the material plus some bonuses, there was a small fee, which was actually shared with also all the instructors so you were kind of it was it was a small thank you gesture for everyone involved mm -hmm. as we shared the the profits so i i run it in in this kind of hybrid model and i found that it works best for for really everyone when you win win for instructors as well as attendees so yeah it's, it's been working really well like that and i think we we do it in a similar fashion uh again this year I love it. I love it. So where, where should we go to watch for that announcement? Is it best to go to your website or on Instagram or, you know, where do we need to keep watching so that we're ready to, to sign up? Yeah. Um, the website, uh, is the place to go sketch like an architect.com. The best, most updated first to know people are on my email list are on my newsletter. And I, and I like to treat them uh, a little bit special. Sure. They know everything in advance and they, they, they are treated in, in different ways than on social media, which is kind of more, more broad. So yeah, sketch like an architect.com uh, newsletter. And that's probably the only place and you'll be sure to, to be the first to know about anything interesting related to, to sketching, of course. The sketching retreat included. I love it. 
I love it. So the sketchlikeanarchitect.com, that's the URL in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen right now. Go over there and uh, check out David's website. It's So I know you said it was technical and it was complicated and all that, but I think the website is beautiful. It's efficient, mm -hmm. and I think it works really well. Um, mm -hmm. So go check out sketchlikeanarchitect.com. Sign up for the newsletter so that you can be one of the first to um, to get signed up, to hear about, and then get signed up for the retreat coming up this autumn. Um, we're Believe it or not, we're already at the top of the hour, and I don't want to keep you up into tomorrow. <laughs> because <laughs> if, in case you missed this at the beginning, David is in Prague, and uh, it's, not, it's not like early in the afternoon for David, so we're going to make sure that he gets out of here so we can go to bed. But, um, but David, first of all, thank you for everything you do. Uh, like I said, I, I, I very much love going over to Instagram and, uh, and watching you sketch, hearing you talk about it, you know, seeing the demonstrations and, and learning uh, as I go. It's very cathartic. So thank you for that. And uh, thanks. Thanks for this great conversation. Thanks for joining us um, and uh, encouraging us to think, I think, think about sketching in different ways, probably than we already have and giving us the freedom to, to explore sketching even further. Fantastic. Thank you so much both to you, Jeff, and and Chris for, for the invitation, for having me. I've enjoyed it so, so much. And yeah, if there's any follow-up questions, I'm always happy to help. Don't be afraid to reach out. And yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and for everybody that is uh, watching right now, uh, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Again, I say this all the time. If it weren't for you, if it weren't for you building this community, we would not be having this conversation with David right now. So thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk with David. Thanks for being a part of all of these conversations. As we look into the future, as we look towards next week on Context and Clarity Live, our guests, plural, next week will be all three co-hosts of the She Builds podcast. I know many of you uh, are familiar with, many of you are fans of She Builds. And so um, all three of the co-hosts will be joining us next week. It's gonna be a lot of fun. If you were able to join us for the Entree Architect Business Summit back in January, I think it was January 13th, uh, one, of, one of the presentations, one of the segments of the Business Summit were the co-hosts of, of She Builds, and it's just fascinating. I love the research that they do, the stories that they tell, uh, the stories that they bring to life is probably a better way to say that. So it's going to be a great conversation with them as well. Um, and one last thing before we go, the Context and Clarity Classroom is open. Um, I will post later this evening, the uh, con Context and Clarity Classroom worksheet for next week. We've, we've made a pivot and we've made the classroom about the week upcoming. So this Monday, we covered uh, this week talking about sketching and simple tools and understanding your ideas and developing your ideas. The homework or, or the worksheet that you'll see today will be related to next week so that you can start getting in the mindset of preparing for this conversation next week and figuring out how you can apply these lessons. Just like there is a lot that you heard today from David that you start thinking about, how can I apply this to my own practice? We're going to do the same thing next week with the ladies from She Builds. So uh, look for that homework. You can find it in the Facebook group, also in the Entree Architect Network later this evening. I've got to, I'm going to run back to a baseball game here. So it's going to be a little bit, honestly, <laughs> before that gets posted. But, um, but that'll, that'll be up there tonight. With and that. everyone, really, they should really go to that the context and clarity club uh, classroom because uh, it's become a little mastermind session. So yeah, come yeah. and have a talk. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that endorsement. I love the way it's growing. I love the way it's developing. And um, yeah, join us, join us for that. Chris, thanks for co-hosting with me today. No David, problem. thank you again. And. For everybody else that's out there, thanks. We appreciate all of you. Please be well, stay safe, keep those around you safe and well. Find a little bit of time to breathe, relax, find a way to rejuvenate. We do this every day. We're 700 and some odd conversations in at this point. So you've got to pace yourself. Thanks for going along this journey and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks everybody.